Chapter 5, On Being Aware, From the Wisdom of Insecurity, A Message for an Age of Anxiety by Alan Watts. It must be obvious from the start that there is a contradiction in wanting to be perfectly secure in a universe whose very nature is momentariness and fluidity. But the contradiction lies a little deeper than the mere conflict between the desire for security and the fact of change. If I want to be secure, that is, protected from the flux of life, I am wanting to be separate from life. Yet it is this very sense of separateness which makes me feel insecure. To be secure means to isolate and fortify the I. But it is just the feeling of being an isolated I which makes me feel lonely and afraid. In other words, <clears throat> the more security I can get, the more I shall want. To put it still more plainly, the desire for security and the feeling of insecurity are the same thing. To hold your breath is to lose your breath. A society based on the quest for security is nothing but a breath retention contest in which everyone is as taut as a drum and as purple as a beat. We look for this security by fortifying and enclosing ourselves in innumerable ways. We want the protection of being exclusive and special, seeking to belong to the safest church, the best nation, the highest class, the right set, and the nice people. These defenses lead to divisions between us, and so to more insecurity demanding more defenses. Of course, it is all done in the sincere belief that we are trying to do the right thing and live in the, in the best way, but this too is a contradiction. Offer as wisdom for the journey. Okay, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, Aga Bahari is a Persian-Canadian entrepreneur and artist. He was born and raised in Iran, where his work was first recognized, and soon after, he was criminalized by the Islamic government of Iran's Supreme Judiciary Court and Ministry of Culture in 2006. His many talents have taken him across the world and to Canada, where he now resides. He co-founded and performed with Iran's first official heavy metal band in 2002 and has collaborated with both Iranian and international music legends. Aga graduated from Vancouver's Film School's Sound Design for Visual Media program in 2010 and has worked as a sound designer and mixer with, num with a number of the world's greatest bands and companies, including Samsung, ESPN, American Express, Bentley, Nestle, the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Commission, and NBC Universal. He's also a voting member of the Recording Academy uh, for Grammy Awards, Karis for Juno Awards, a member of the Toronto Transhumanists Association, and a co-founder of an information technology company called EnsoMind. Aga will talk to us this morning about growing up in Iran during the Iran-Iraq War, the longest war of the 20th century, and share with us his journey on becoming a Canadian citizen. And as I understand, I'm going to go out on a limb here, I think he's offered to allow us to just ask him questions. So. Um, before, during, I guess not, not, not before. How about during or sure, after? Yeah. 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 He yeah, seems pretty open, which is great. So uh, with that, I give you Aga. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. So I don't usually write what I'm supposed to talk about, so I'm just going to go in spontaneously. But I have some titles. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I met uh, Reverend Vosper the first time about a year and a half ago at uh, the breakfast with Richard Dawkins, which was uh, pretty amazing, a reverend from a church being at an atheist event. 
And then I came here for the first time about a year ago, and there was not a single mention of Jesus or Bible, so I felt like uh, this is a church that I can, can associate with. So it's a pleasure to be back. <clears throat> I usually start from my parents' story. My parents were born, both of them in Iran, and uh, raised until they're at the age of 19th or 20th in the family. Both families were uh, incredibly interested in communism. And this is a pre-revolutionary Iran uh, during Shah era. So the revolution in Iran, I don't know how much you know about that, but it was planned and demonstrated by many different groups, but was hijacked by one group who currently ruling that, uh, that country, which is a Shia Muslim, I will say cult, but they pretty well managed to uh, govern the country for the past 30, 30 odd years. So my parents went to the United States about two years before the revolution happened. My mother was studying architecture, my father was studying economics. And then the revolution happened and my father wanted to go back to Iran to serve the country because all the changes are supposed to happen for good. So my father is going back to Iran, my mother is going back with him. And about a year later the war began between Iran and Iraq. And three years into the war I was born. And when you're being born in Iran, it's very interesting to know, I think, that when you're one second old, you're Iranian, Muslim, and Shia, and there's no way to go on back. If you change it based on the law, they can execute you. So I was a one second old Muslim, Iranian, Shia in the middle of a war. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, my father shared the same feeling with me, I suppose. He went to the front to truly serve the country. He came back after a year and was a completely changed man, according to uh, what I heard from his friends and my mom's friends. So he left Iran when I was two, which was about a year later, and I've never seen him ever again. And this was 29 years ago. So I stayed with my mom, her mother, and her sister at one apartment. We uh, lived about five years through the war. I remember the bombardments, I remember the sirens. There were times that uh, we were watching a children program, for my sake, I believe, me and my mom, and then there was a siren going on, red siren going on, and we had about a minute to go and hide. And not that many people have left in our neighborhood, mostly went to the cities around Tehran, because Tehran became a very um, crucial target for Iraqi army. So when the war ended in um, 1987, about a year later, I went to school, and going to school in Iran is a quite experience by itself. When you're a boy, you go to the only boy schools. When you're a girl, you go to the only girl school. There is no such a thing as mixed school. And for the first time, I experienced the school environment in Iran that you have to wait in the morning for them to read from Quran, and then they give you a speech, which is political and religious. And then you go into your classroom, walking on the flags of the United States and Israel. And my father used to live in the United States. I love the United States. All the good things were coming from the United States, from cartoons to uh, cookies and everything. So I never did that. I always was jumping with a couple of my friends on the flag. But that was something that was going on for the entire school years. So I went to school there for about 12 years. Um, Living in Iran in a situation that I was, as well as many other people, more modern families are living, it's quite a challenge because a lot of people around you in your neighborhood and your school are spies. They are telling you for whatever thing that is being uh, considered as a crime by the Islamic government. I took two tapes to the school when I was in the third grade. I got, um, I got expelled for it for about a week. You, don't, uh, you were not allowed to listen to the Western music. Western music instruments were, uh, were banned. VHS player were banned. Uh, we had two channels on TV, and uh, in our home we had an illegal uh, video player. Which getting uh, movies for, those, uh, the, for that device was a challenge by itself. We had to wait for a guy who was basically smuggling all those uh, videotapes on a suitcase, and we were going through it, and we had very... Um, small amount of uh, options. So you can say how much I appreciate Netflix right now. <laughs> so when you're growing up in Iran, 
Well, I was, in, I was growing up in a very westernized uh, family. My father was in America. All our relatives were going to America and coming back telling all the good stuff about America and West. My mother was a very open-minded person. Found a Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, Led Zeppelin. So these were the kind of music along with Pink Floyd I got introduced to when I was four or five. And then I had to go to school and uh, coding from the verses of Quran and learn about uh, the history, which I realized was all made up. Uh, after Islam is the history of Iran. And then you go into a neighborhood and you have, a, you have to create a completely new persona. Because the kids in the, in the neighborhood, they don't care about what you're doing at home. They don't care about what you're doing at the school. It has its own politics and you have to learn how to, how to deal with it. Beside police and military, there's another group in Iran called Revolutionary Guard, which is basically uh, the army dedicated and specific to the government of Iran. And they have a sect called Basij, which is people, normal people with uh, plain clothes, they can join. Um, it's a very fundamental base, but they're usually using them for the political purposes as well. So those are the people who stop you on the street if you're holding a hand with a girl. If there is a girl who is not um, covering her hair very well or, you know, short sleeves and all that stuff. I got arrested twice by those guys because of Metallica t-shirts, I'm proud to say. Um, but before that, because the first time I got arrested, I was around 11 and the second time I was around 17. But before that, um, we had a kind, kind of a conflict with the government. My mother's sister were talking bad about war in the, uh, in the taxi cab. There was a spy as a driver. So we all got arrested. I spent the night with my mother in a solitary confinement at the age of around four. And then I was uh, taken to my grandparents. My mom, my grandmother, and uh, my aunt stayed in uh, prison for about three months. And that was the last summer of the war between Iran and Iraq where uh, the government of, of Iran decided to basically clearing the system by killing all the polit as many political oppositions as they possibly could and using war as an excuse. So we were lucky to make it, okay, I think. Um, I got really interested into music since I was a kid uh, with Pink Floyd and everything that I was listening to. Um, I wanted to play uh, guitar. I started playing an island string guitar. I didn't have a good teacher. I changed it to keyboard because we couldn't afford the piano. The keyboard was illegal. So we had to uh, get on a car. It was a rainy night. I was sick. So we had to go to somebody's place, wrap the keyboard in the sheet, put it in the car, and then just take it back home and just keep it secret for the next four years. The system opened up a little bit. I got more into more Western music, more modern music, like heavy metal and thrash metal music. And Metallica was the biggest force there. So I decided to move to electric guitar when I was 14. And that was a challenge by itself. It was maybe like three electric guitar available and uh, one street with the music stores in Tehran back then. So I started learning on my own. Then found other people to uh, play with. And... Um, Finally, we formed a band, which was the first official heavy metal band or metal band of any kind in post-revolutionary Iran or Iran in general. And the reason I'm saying it official is that anything cultural you do in Iran, you have to go to a place called Ministry of Culture, and they have to give you permission, whether it's a book or a movie or a music, anything. So we had to do the same thing. We faked all, all, all our music. We played it with a half tempo. We gave it to them. We got permission, and we performed as the first official heavy metal band. Um, I went to Turkey a couple of months after that. I used the money I made out of concert to see my favorite band at the time named Dream Theater. Don't feel bad if you don't know them. Very obscure. Um, and when I came back from Turkey, I decided that music is something I want to take very seriously. And the guitar player of Dream Theater at the at time, and still now, was a graduate from Berklee College of Music in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And this is in 2003. So I decided to go to Berkeley. I applied for Berkeley. I got accepted at Berkeley. And I had to go to Turkey in uh, Ankara to a U.S. embassy because the United States does not have any embassy in Iran since 1979. Uh, I went to the Turkey embassy and my visa request was rejected because it was a post 9-11 kind of occasions and everybody from the Middle East, we all know, all terrorists. So I couldn't go there. I came back to Iran and formed my second band, which was an instrumental progressive band called DNA, 
We were rather interested in science and technology and effect of uh, technology and uh, evolution of human, human race. We played that, and then three years after that, I realized that I got banned for that concert because we had a video projection on one of our songs. We had a swimming sperm, which they had a very, very big problem with. I played underground shows for the three years and then went to the Ministry of Culture to ask for the copies of the permissions that I've got for those two bands and they said that we can't give you anything, you were banned for the three years. And then I told them that we've been, you know, I just got mad. What do you mean that I got banned? And I told them that we were playing underground shows for the past three years and made them mad. Um, it was about a, a week and a half, ten days after that, that I got a letter that I was uh, asked to go back to the Ministry of Culture and talk to the security department. And uh, a, a day after that, we had sort of a raid to our house. They took my computer, they took my books, they took my passport, they took uh, a lot of our tapes, videos, everything. And at that time, me and my mother, we thought that this is a good time for me to leave because they probably are not a very big fan of what we're doing here. So, I had about a week, I gave myself a week to, to leave Iran. I had no idea, I didn't have a passport, I didn't know what to do. I opened up a newspaper and started calling every single classifieds about travel agencies. And I just told them, I want to go to the United States, or I want to go to Canada, because I can't speak English, and those countries are awesome. Finally, after hours of trying, somebody told me we can get you a business visa to Canada and then you go there and then the rest of it is up to you. The visa is for two weeks, you just get to Canada and then the rest of, the rest of it is completely up to you. So say, yeah, that's a good idea. He called me about an hour later and said, we can't do that, but we have another friend in New Zealand who can give you, get you an original New Zealand passport. So that sounds good. A day later, he called me and said, we can't do that, but there's another way, but you have to come here for me to explain it to you. So I went there with my mother, and he said, you go to Malaysia from Iran with a fake passport. In Malaysia, we give you another fake passport, and then you go to Canada. I said, this is a wonderful news. My mom started crying. It was very worrying for her, and it was a little bit of money, which was uh, at that time around $15,000 for me to get to Canada, which we, at that time, we didn't really know. Would I end up in the United States or would I end up in Canada? So we paid the money. I left Iran with a fake passport. I went to Malaysia. I was in Kuala Lumpur for a month. I received my second passport, which was a real Canadian passport, but what they do is that they open up a page into two half and then slide your photo instead of the original photo. So stamps and everything is there. And then we went to me and a couple of other people who were doing the same thing. We went to Hong Kong, we took a cab into China, and I was in China for a week. Uh, we went up from a, a southern city, Guangzhou, to Shanghai, and then I flew to Vancouver. I realized that I'm coming to Vancouver when I was getting the tickets at the airport in Shanghai. I had no idea about Canada, I knew that there's a city exists called Toronto and Montreal. I had no other uh, experience knowing it. I was a big fan of the United States. Also, I knew that Canada is north of the United States. That's about it. So I got to Vancouver. I claimed refugee. I stayed in um, airport detention. They have a prison in airport for five days. And then we had our court hearing. The court was uh, waiting for our documents to arrive so they can translate it and know we are saying who we are, who we say. We are who we say we are. And it was not ready at that day, so we had to stay one more week in prison for the next uh, court date. And we stayed in, um, me and another friend stayed in um, high security, I think, believe, a state prison called uh, North Fraser. North Fraser State Prison in, uh, in, around Vancouver. And then I got released, my case was accepted, and then I came to uh, Toronto because I knew somebody who knew somebody in Oakville. So for the two years, I had to go to an immigration office somewhere close. I, I used to live in uh, King and Dufferin, uh, kind of downtownish. I had to go for two years to a place close to airport to sign that I'm still in the country. I'm not, I'm not doing anything shady. I'm not funding any terrorist. And after two years, um, two, two and a half years, I moved to Vancouver to study in Vancouver Film School. And there was a time that I got my permanent residency. 
permanent residency card, which was for the first time that I could get a travel document and actually travel outside of Canada. So I got my travel document. I went to, um, I went to United States for the first time in 2011. I went to New York. I stayed in New York for two months. Um, and then went back to Canada. The plan was to come to Toronto and um, make a little bit of money and then go back to Vancouver because I had some sort of a life going on in Vancouver. When I got back to, Canada, to Toronto, about uh, two weeks later after that, I found out that my mother has been arrested in Iran on uh, a mixed charges which started economically, but then they kind of tended into political. The reason for that would be our family name, me and my uncle, Maziar Bahari, are not very popular in Iran. My uncle, Maziar Bahari, was arrested in the last election, the, the last election before the last one in Iran about five years ago when he was in Iran um, as a journalist for, working for Newsweek. And then there was a coup going on, there was a coup d'etat that happened after Iranian election. He was covering that, he got arrested, he was in uh, Iran's most notorious prison, Evin prison, in uh, solitary confinement for 118 days until Hil Hillary Clinton talked about him. So they let him go. And uh, in absence they gave him 15 to 20 years, I think, if he goes back to Iran he'll end up staying in jail for 20 years. Um, so I went to New York, I came back to Toronto, my mother got arrested, and it was a very weird situation because I didn't have anybody to talk about those things with. And I, I was completely helpless, and your parents is in prison, but more than that, you are in the other side of the world and you have absolutely no way to go back there to help her and there was a lot of pressure on you. I really needed to talk to someone. I didn't have the money to pay for a psychiatrist. I didn't want to bother anybody with it, of my close friends. I was very interested in Buddhism for years. So that was the first thing that came to my mind. Just go to a Buddhist temple and talk to someone, they probably would understand. So I went to a Zen temple that used to be on college in Spadina. It's in St. Clair now and tried to talk to someone. They said that we can't talk to you, we have our private meeting. So I was just sitting there, sitting there with my hands, on, uh, with my head on my hands, feeling very bad. And I met a guy, he was a Japanese Zen master. I never asked his name, he never asked mine. I used to call him Sensei and he was calling me Tyson. And we stayed in touch for the, for the next year. And he pretty much changed my life. My mother got released uh, 14 months later. But that 14 month was a um, transforming experience. I, it forced me to grow up, basically. I focused on my job, which I was working on uh, different movie sets and TV sets and commercial sets as a sound designer and uh, the record, uh, and recording uh, engineer. Music, I continued doing it. I released my first album in 2008. Um, and in 2012, I became a voting member of the Recording Academy, the Grammy Awards, and for Juno Awards. And I went to the Grammys for the first time in 2013, which was just mind-blowing experience. And uh, I finally became a citizen in May, 29th of May, and it took seven and a half years. And thank you. Thank you. But the reason I really want to talk to you guys, because I think you understand that this is a church that is not about one specific way of thinking. This is a church where, based on what I learned, is that you guys care about knowledge, wisdom, and evolution of a human being in general. Living in Iran, going through different countries, and meeting with a lot of people, I want to say that most people, doesn't matter what they believe in, they just want to be happy. They just want to have a good life. Everybody have a different definition for it. But the goal, I do believe, is the same thing. The goal is happiness. How to get to happiness, I came up with a way. It's a, it's a triangle that you have to follow. It's health success and fulfillment. You have to be healthy mentally and physically. You have to be successful at whatever it is that you do. And you have to be fulfilled, which is doing what you like to do to make a living out of it. And through Buddhism, 
because I grew up as a very spoiled kid. I was the only one and I was completely selfish. This is mine. Why should you have it? It's mine. But through Buddhism, I went through a process of learning that giving and sharing is part, if not the biggest part, of that fulfillment. And I really do believe that we are living in quite possibly the best country in the world and in definitely the best time in human history where each and every one of us have the opportunity to make a change not only in our lives but in everybody else's life. We have a technology which is more powerful than any other technology we've ever had. This cell phone, which all of you have, is a thousand times stronger than a computer people use to send a man to the moon with. And what are we doing with it? We're just texting and checking our Facebook. There's so much more that can be done and I think there's never been a better opportunity than now because most of the people is in chaos. Most of the people all around the world are dealing with the things that are not their war. What's going on in Syria? What's going on in Israel, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq? It's not ordinary people's war. They don't care what those people are fighting about. They're using religion, they're using ideology. Islam just happened to be prominent now because I think Islam is going through the changes that Christianity had did. Islam is going through that changes now but they're more fundamentalists in their belief, the people who are doing all the killings and all the bombings and everything. So I think it's important for us to realize that all we are are member of the same species in a, more, in a more specific way, in a more general way, we are all connected to each other. I have traveled for 31, for 31 years and 24 days to be here and talking to you today, and I could not plan it. A series of things has happened like dominoes to put me here, and it's the same thing for all of you. Wherever you are in life, just look at it and ask yourself, am I happy where I am or am I not happy where I am? And that's the only question you have to be asking yourself. If you are happy, then everything that has happened was for good. Because where you are right now is a good thing. If you're not happy, then realize why not and just fix it. Because the past is gone. What is that thing in the, the movie, the Kung Fu Panda? I always tell my friends that yesterday is history, tomorrow is mystery, today is a gift. That's why it's called present. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any question if you have any question. Yes. I know it's making no sense, so I'll try to Yeah, can you hear me? No. Okay. So some people some people have, have uh, told me that the revolution in Iran uh, was caused, was a direct result of the uh, attempted westernization by the United States, uh, obviously for their own purposes, setting up a puppet government and um, essentially ending up eroding the traditional values and culture um, of the, of, of the uh, Iranian people. So in, in your opinion, I know you were young when you lived there, um, but what were the factors that drove the radicalization, um, the, the, the fundamentalist um, aspects in, in Iran? And you also mentioned, it's a two-part question, you also mentioned that, and, and again, I've heard a lot of people say this, that what Islam is going through is very similar to what Christianity went through. And I, I, I somewhat agree, but anyway, if you could sort of gaze into your crystal ball. So the first part is, is what drove it. And then looking ahead, where, where do you see this falling out? I mean, you know, if this is a part of a necessary phase, uh, you know, for fundamentalism to travel through, where do you see it falling out? You know, for Iran or Islam? Um, let's start off with what drove it in Iran, okay. and then let's end it with Islam. I, I, I'm quite interested in, in to hear your opinion on, on both areas. Well, the revolution in Iran, I think it was the third attempt in one century in Iran to change the system. The first one was made more than a century ago. They're calling it Mashrute, which they asked for democracy, but um, 
it was not successful. But the biggest uh, problem with the United States, I think what happened in 1953, which was um, the nationalization of oil in Iran, the prime minister um, who was overthrown by the coup d'etat that was backed by the United States. And they are saying it now that CIA had an operative in Iran and um, it was a Rockefeller actually, mm -hmm. from CIA who was an operative in Iran. But the third one was a continuation of what happened in 53 till 1979. And I think what Shah did was Shah wanted to brought Iran and take Iran into a massive rapid change to a contemporary world and contemporary values. And Iran is a highly, highly religious society. I mean, some, sometimes even with the media, you look at Tehran, you look at some major big cities, but we forget that a lot of those smaller cities, a lot of those small villages, those are the people who still go to Shia Muslim shrines, Shia shrines in specific in Iraq, it doesn't matter how badly it's being bombarded and uh, how unsafe it is in Iraq or in Syria. And there are people who are volunteering right now to go and fight in Iraq because who's um, ISIS in Iraq? They're Sunnis and they're the main enemy of the Shia. So a lot of people were ready for the ideology that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was, um, was introducing. But what happened after the revolution is very different than what, what they were promising. Because it used to be they used to talk more open, and I think another big mistake that Shah did, well I'm not in a position to say what kind of mistake, but it's just my personal opinion, to send Ayatollah Khomeini in exile to Paris, which was, or to France, he didn't stay in Paris. It opened up a lot of an opportunity for him to talk to a Western media and basically spread his message internationally. And then they basically hijacked the revolution because there were a lot of groups involved, but uh, this specific group uh, of ayatollahs and mullahs, they were the one who basically started killing first. So isn't, isn't ISIS, aren't, aren't they essentially the followers of the ayatollah? No. Islam has two main branches. Well, basically one main branch and then a lot of different uh, segments. Uh, the main ones are Sunnis, which are m the majority of Muslims in the world. And then there are Shias, which 99% of the population in Iran is Shia. A lot of majority of Iraq is Shia, majority of uh, Syrians are Shia. But that's about it. So ISIS, they're Sunnis. Shia are just as big of an enemy f uh, for them as the uh, United States. And then what was the question about Iran? Well, um, no, I think you've answered uh, around Iran, but in terms of uh, Islam in general, mm -hmm. and I know you can't, I mean, it's like talking about Christianity right. in general, it's kind of hard to do, but you made a comment that, um, that, that Islam is moving through a lot of what Christianity did, and some people will actually put a timeline on, well, you know, five, six hundred years ago, this is what Christianity was doing, and draw a lot of parallels between that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just sort of carry on with, with that thought of it. Um, okay. where, where do you see um, Islam landing or, you know, their, the evolution of Islam? Because certainly Christianity is going through an evolution. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think what happened to Christianity, it might have started with Martin Luther that went through the, the main changes to um, Catholicism, basically. But the main thing happened in the Western society after science, after intro an introduction of science and scientific thinking and scientific reasoning. And that's something that if, you, if you're a smart society, you, you want to adopt science, you want to adopt technology, because that's, those are the elements that help you improve. But Islam, the problem is that the majority of countries who are Muslims, and Islam in the political sense of it, you see in the Middle East, the main source of income for them is oil. So, what happened in Iran, I think Iran had a very good opportunity 30, 35 years ago to go through a lot of changes that would have made Iran a country similar to Turkey because I think it would be very naive to co compare Iran to Switzerland or England or Canada or United States. It's just a process that has been um, taken and process that has been uh, passed in these countries that Iran hasn't been through yet. There are a lot of fundamental problems. There are a lot of social problems. 
that Islam basically come and give you a very simple answer. The dif biggest difference between Islam and Christianity being Christianity is the word of God transferred by somebody else. In Islam, it is the word of God. You can't change a single word. And they're just extremely violent about it as Christians were 500, 600, 700 years ago. What will happen to Islam? It's very hard to say, but I... Uh, I tend to be an optimist and I just look at the younger generation that what they're doing mostly present at, you know they are the generation that are growing up on the internet it's not only what your parents are telling you it's not what you're learning in the school but it's also what everybody else in the world are talking about and how you can be a part of that and how you can evolve with somebody else at the end this is a philosophy that I came up with whatever you are you have to think for yourself, are you human first or that thing, whatever it is, Muslim, Christian, whatever. Because the moment you realize that I'm a human first, then we have a lot in common. To just sit down and talk about what is good for human race. Because if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jew, if you're a Buddhist, anything, you are still a human. Um, I'm just going to talk a little very fast about the transhumanist uh, association that we have. I to do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but transhumanism is basically the interest in the effect of technology and human evolution that has already began. Uh, you can see a lot of prosthetics are computerized now. There are a lot of implants that are being used for uh, Alzheimer patients and a lot of other uh, people in need. And this is something that will carry on and evolve much faster than we've ever seen before because something called uh, the exponential progress rate of technology which is, instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you go in 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. And with something like that in 30 steps in a linear way, which we tend to think, you can go from 1 to 30 and exponentially you can pass a billion. And this is what is happening to our computers now. This is why everything is getting smaller and more powerful for the same unit of dollar. So it's very important, I think, to realize that because this is something that hasn't begun yet in the commercial way and in the mainstream way, but it is, it is starting in the next decade. And this is something that a lot of people call, calling it the human's last invention, which is artificial intelligence. Um, and we are looking forward to get to a day that we will be half biological, half technological, and create basically human 2.0, but that's like a complete different talk We're by itself. We're going to have to have you back to talk sure, about Sure, I'll that. be happy to. <laughs> We are writing a book, me and my friend, about this experience. And I will be more than happy to come back when the book is I done think already. Has a question for sure. You. Microphone oh, is you needed. Don't need a mic, Steve. Just stand up. Stand, stand up. Okay, well, okay. I'd like to offer a there People in the West sometimes just take one view of uh, Islam. Is, is whatever is happening today in the world, is there, is there a picture? Okay. Is there a picture of Islam, right? And, uh, and I, uh, so I'm speaking more as a person who grew up in this country. And uh, I, and it, 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 it's only by delving deeper below the, below the surface of things that you actually find out stuff that's quite interesting, right? Okay, so um, around the time of the European Renaissance, your, question, your uh, comment about well the changes that Christianity was going through in the in the uh, 15th, 16th uh, century are like what's happened was starting to happen in Islam. Um, what I think most Westerners don't appreciate is that most of the scientific discoveries that happened in Europe around the time of the Renaissance were um, in fact uh, picked up on, or they, they, they began uh, not in a vacuum, but they began by, by learning about the things that Muslim scholars had been, had been studying and writing about. And, when their works became available in, in Italian and other uh, uh, European languages, then of course there was a scientific revolution in Europe, right? Which went against the Catholic Church, right? I mean, there were Muslim scholars who were far advanced in astronomy, navigation, algebra, or biology. They knew about the circulation of blood and some, um, some European guy said he discovered it and it was actually not him but it was actually 
discovered in the Middle East. Uh, by, and uh, so the, in, in the area of science, Islamic countries were far in advance of Western countries, and Western countries picked up on those advances and then took them further, right? So I had to say that only because we get this awfully ethnocentric view of the, being Westerners and being Canadians and being of European descent, we get a very ethnocentric view of the world. That anything that ever, ever anything that any any good that ever happened in the world happened in Europe, right? And then it spread elsewhere. And it's only when you read history, and I think the the disservice that the fundamentalists in Islam are due to their own religion is that Islam was one of had a tradition up until a certain point when it got derailed, I don't know when, but had a tradition of, of, of not only uh, uh, tolerating scientific inquiry, but encouraging it, right? And uh, we've got to remember that when, when the Jews were expelled from Spain, I understand that Greta Vosper traces their ancestry back to uh, those Jews who were expelled mm -hmm. from Spain in 1492, about the same time that uh, Columbus was set off to uh, New to, World. Yeah, to, to do to the native people in this country what the Spaniards had done to the Moors in Spain. Um, when they were, when the Jews were expelled from Spain, who welcomed them? It was the uh, Ottoman Emperor who said, I cannot understand why you guys, why, this, why you would want to expel the Jews. And they were welcomed into, uh, into uh, Muslim countries, right, as refugees. And they prospered there for many centuries because uh, they, were, they were considered people of the book, so to speak, right? Um, so there's a different view, and uh, I just hope that people appreciate that what, you know, the picture that we get of Islam today is not the picture that I study in history, nor is it my experience, and I'm, most of the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis are actually Muslim, <coughs> right? And uh, I made a study of Islam just to... Uh, try to sort these things out in my own mind and I came up with a couple of good things. <laughs> Just like if I studied Zen Buddhism I'm sure I would come up with some good things. Sure. And if I studied, uh, most of my neighbors are Sikh and I make a point of trying to find, figure out what they're all about. <laughs> and I try to study as many different religions as I can. I try to find what's good in, in each one of them and I tell my Muslim friends I have discovered some good things about your religion. And they'll ask me, well, what did you discover? And, they'll, and I'll tell them and they'll say, yeah, you actually got that right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So I'm sorry I went on too long. No, that's awesome. No, but I just maybe you have some comment on, sure. on what I just said. I, I think I, our... I just, yeah, sorry. I yeah, just yeah. want to say we do have one more comment and then, okay, and cool. then we might want to wrap it sure. up. The last time, by the way, I, I, the last time I spoke at church, it was uh, a, a Mormon church. I was politely asked to not go back. <laughs> so I'm hoping the same experience wouldn't be repeated here. Yes, sir. Well, uh, yes, you're right. It's, uh, it's more of a comment than a question. Uh, two comments. First one is, I was born in the same place that... Uh, Bahar, Bahari, Bahari is born, um, and I was there also for, during the war times and when he was born and before for for nine, nine years there after the Islamic uh, mm -hmm. events. And I want to say to people here, you can give hundred out of hundred what it says. So genuine what it says and exactly give the picture of what happened there. There's a film Persepolis, you probably know that, and you watch that movie and that's genu genuine, that's real. 
So I, I was listening, I was kind of devouring what he was saying because just exactly what happened there to so many people. And he said in such a nice way and you know he speaks so well, I wish I could speak that way well too. Thank you. But then when you ask the question about what happened to you and why this Islamic revolution, Karen, this is a one million dollar question. There are so many books written about this which none of it satisfies me because you have different perspective about it. And so that's one of the comments I want to say. Um, uh, there was a long question here, so I'll let you answer. But I have something to say. If you allow me, I can sure, say yeah. later. Thank you. First. Now or later? <laughs> later. Okay, um, I'm just going to re comment on your comment, I guess. Uh, the problem is not the people. You can believe whatever you want to believe. I have friends who are Satanists. They don't even believe in Satan. It just sounds cool. But the problem is that there are countries who are using that specific kind of religion as a political force to justify their moves. And they're taking everybody else in that country who might be Muslim as I am, because I was born a Muslim, just because my parents were Muslim, just because my parents, uh, their parents were Muslim. And I can't change it because, officially I can't change it. They don't recognize renouncing your citizenship. They don't recognize going back from Islam. It is on the law that they can kill you if you go back from Islam. Another problem is that I'm not talking about Iran, but I'm talking about Pakistan, for example. It's a Muslim country. They have 200 nuclear weapons. They have 200 nuclear warheads. It can't change the entire world. And they're using Islam as an alibi. They're using Islam as an excuse. Islam to me, the Quran, which is by the way only one book as a resource for Muslims. They have also Hadith and they have the, the Sira, which is the way that Prophet used to live. The fundamentalist Muslim, they do the exact same thing based on all three books. But if you're just a genuine person who wants to learn something about it, it's just one more book. I just quoted from Kung Fu Panda. You can learn from Kung Fu Panda. You can learn from Quran. You can learn from walking on the street and talking to a homeless person. It's just a matter of your consciousness. How, how big is your consciousness? How receptive you are? to different ideas which might completely collide with what you believe in and how open you are to embrace all of those hear everything but come up with your own ideology in, in, not in a bad way but your own philosophy of life of course you, can, you should use everything but my main thing is that there is a, there is a government for example in Iran or using Islam in not a very genuine way to keep everybody else including my friends and family as hostage for their needs. And whenever they have to talk about to defend themselves, they're like, we are representing the, the population of Iran, the nation of Iran. But it's not like that. There is a minority who have some ideals, and they interpret that book in the way that they want. These are very subjective texts. It's not the law of life. These are not how you're supposed to live, because they've been written how long ago? Like 10 centuries ago, 15 centuries ago. We have science now. We don't need any of those. But at the end of the day, if it helps you to go one step further in your journey, whatever that journey is, by all means. But my problem is with the governments and the ideological use of someone, some group of people like ISIS who are going and killing people just because they're Shia or just because they're uh, working for the, the military in Iraq or anything like that. I would like to add, I would like to add uh, to your question, the, the question that was asked was important. I'm so pleased that we're talking about this in, in this place, in this church, it's so fantastic. Uh, it's fundamental that everyone makes the distinction between Muslim and Islam. I was born Muslim, I didn't ask to be circumcised, I didn't ask to be Muslim, you probably were born Christian, you didn't ask to be Christian. It's a fundamental distinction and uh, Aga said it very well. He said, you know, people are different than the religion. So Islam is what Bar says is the book, is the hadith, is the way the prophet, these are the examples. But 
Aga Horai or Shayan were born Muslim. We didn't ask to it, so don't look at Muslim. Don't put a label on Muslims. <laughs> That's it. Islam is a different thing, and you're allowed to criticize Islam. Why not? That's how in Christianity we had the reform, and that's how Allah say we're trying to have this reform just by speaking as he speaks and as I do. So that's, that's very important. And I want to say something about, it's important to say, say Islam has so many scientists, so many artists, look at Spain, what happened, tolerance, that was in Islam. Any of these people, name one by one, these are people who started getting out of Islam, becoming free thinkers. What is Abu Ali Sina? What, and most of them were Iranians, by the way, at the time when the caliphate became weakened and they were allowed to speak and to think freely, and that's what, what has a result. So don't talk, you read the, in history book, I know, but history is written and repeated by some people who had the power. And Islam had the power. Islam is scary. When I started my first day, Sharian is here, when I started saying that this book is old, that was it. Some student came in, sir, don't say that, they're going to shoot you. Another one went to the principal and said, we don't want to be taped here. It's scary. Islam is scary and the book is scary too. I'm saying that it's true, it's the fact. But Muslims are not scary. They, they just be submitted to that religion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm going to wrap up the formal part of our service. Do we have coffee? today? Yes? So you know what? We can continue, as I'm sure many of us want to, um, to the left. And I want to thank you formally, Aga. It's been a very, very stimulating conversation. Um, personally, I want to say, I know Muslims aren't scary. My daughter's marrying one. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> my daughter is a little scary, but no, no. My... <laughs> My future son-in-law loves the guy. I was going to tell something. Yeah. Anything can be scary. Fire can be scary if you burn, burn down your house. But also we have evolved yeah. and we have progress in the way that we have because of fire. Because yeah. of every single tool that we have. Absolutely. It's a tool that can be a weapon or it can be a helping hand to a fellow human being. Absolutely. And, you know, we have so many books of wisdom, so many... Um, I don't want to say ideology. That's kind of become a not nice word. But um, just to just to wrap it up, I mean, we do have so many sources of learning, and it is a wonderful thing to celebrate, as you said, that we can do it openly and securely and feeling safe in this environment without judgment, that we're actually learning, as Steve, you pointed out so eloquently. We have so much to learn from each other and debate in a healthy and respectful way to celebrate the diversity that is the world. So again, Again, thank you, Aga. Please you. Uh, join us for thank coffee. So and um, let's uh, get out into the world. And remember, we are the light. And um, let's keep it shining. <laughs>